Hello everyone, uh, today I'm going to go over a very exciting game played between Eugenio Torre and Anatoly Karpov. Uh, the game was held as a part of the exhibitional tournament organized by uh, the Philips and Drew stockbroking firm from London in 1984 and it was it was a part of the chess renaissance in the United Kingdom and especially in London which, which saw a steep rise in popularity of the game and uh, it culminated with the rematch Karpov Kasparov which was held in 86 the, their match for the world championship title and in the years prior to that uh, a lot of uh, tournaments were organized and a lot of investors actually wanted to sponsor them and this one was sponsored by Philips and Drew and uh, the London City Council uh, they uh, invited 14 of the world's some of the strongest grandmasters among others uh, Yasser Seyravan, Viktor Korchnoi, John Nunn Tony Miles, Jan Timan, Lev Polugaevsky, Spielman, of course, Anatoly Karpov and Eugenio Torre. So the tournament was really strong uh, at the time and it was the first all Grandmaster tournament ever, ever held in the United Kingdom. And in this game, Torre faced Karpov with white pieces. Uh, Karpov finished the tournament in first place with, uh, with nine points and Eugenio Torre was unfortunately in last place. But uh, this game made up uh, for his uh, bad performance in the tournament generally. Eugenio Torre opened with pawn to, e4, pawn to d4. Uh, we have knight to f6, c4, e6, inviting the Nimtso Indian defense. Knight to c3 and now bishop to b4 by Anatoly Karpov and this is now the Nimtso Indian. e4, c5, the Hubner variation by Anatoly Karpov and this was a line which was uh, probably the most popular one uh, in the 80s if in the normal Nimtso Indian lines with uh, without uh, queen to c2. And after c c2, uh, c5 Eugenio Torre plays knight to e2. This is now the Rubinstein variation of the Hubner. Now c takes d4, e takes d4, castles and a3. This is all the main line and this has only been, been seen a few thousand times before. Uh, a3 chasing the bishop away. It's not uh, that common to take here. Much better is to play bishop to e7 and there's actually a few hundred games with bishop to e7 and perhaps only one game with bishop takes uh, c3. So bishop to e7 d5 and this is where the where the variation bra branches out there is two main moves d5 and knight to f4 Eugenio Torre went for d5 which is a slightly which is slightly less common but it's more active for white and it, uh, even though the position is immediately equal for black because d5 could be argued that it's overextending white's pawns and it would have been more solid to keep the pawn on d4 it it gives white more activity and more uh, attacking prospects the other the other move after bishop to e7 is knight to f4, which, which is slightly more solid. So the line goes uh, knight to f4, d5 by black now, c takes, knight takes, knight c takes d5, e takes d5, and bishop to d3. And in this position, white is already organizing an attack, but uh, his position is slightly more passive than in the previous uh, position, because he gave black a lot of counterplay as well. His king is still, uh, he's still on e1, and black also has the e-file to play with. Uh, black can uh, uh, develop develop the bishop to g to g4 or to f5 if the squares get defended, or he could even uh, choose to play b6 and bishop to b7 and try to open up the diagonal the, di the diagonal somehow. So black has a lot of activity as well. And d5, uh, this other line with d5 gives white much more attacking prospects than to black. Uh, the line continues. E takes d5. C takes d5, bishop to c5. And there, there is still some games from this position, some played by Tony Miles and by Svetozar uh, Gligoric, the Serbian grandmaster, Yugoslavian at the time. So this was a line extremely popular in the 80s and there's still 20 or 30 games uh, continuing from this position. B4 now, uh, gaining a tempo on the bishop, bishop to b6 and knight to a4, attacking the bishop and uh, threatening to double black's pawns, but in exchange black would get the open a file for his rook, and that's actually the main line. There are two moves here uh, black could opt for, uh, one is rook to e8, staring at white's king, and the other one is d6, uh, just opening up the bishop finally on the diagonal. And Anatoly Karpov goes for d6, and now uh, Tore continues with the main line. Knight takes b6, a takes b6, and knight to g3. Solidifying the center, defending e4 with the knight, not letting black infiltrate. And Karpov plays uh, a tempo move, the main line once again. Rook to e8, bishop to e2, and now rook to e5. And this is the end of theory, uh, so to speak. 
and this is where the the games branch out and there are only a few more games from this position but all in all it's a it's a very theoretical line with 15 moves of theory and it has been greatly analyzed in the 80s but in the last uh, decade it uh, people started abandoning it a bit because white is definitely slightly better and he has at least half a pawn uh, advantage according to the engines and in the 80s of course they couldn't have known that known that but black is equal and uh, almost equal and he has he has those double pawns on the b file but he has two very active rooks compared to white's rooks because the rook on h1 and on a1 are the rooks on h1 and a1 are still doing nothing and the rooks on e5 and on a8 are actually very active now the game continues with bishop to b2, uh, gaining a tempo on the rook and developing the bishop on the long diagonal. This is actually uh, the best move in the position, giving up d5, because white has to give some material in order to develop normally, since his king is still in the center and he can't afford defending this pawn with, let's say, uh, well, there's actually no, no way to defend it anyway. But prior to this, he could have organized the defense of d5, but that would have been too much of a time waste. So now rook takes d5, queen to c1, of course, getting away from the glare of the rook knight to c6 and now white finally castles and the position is now actually a lot better for white because white's extra pawn is meaningless or okay it's the it's the d pawn but this pawn could easily be surrounded and attacked very soon and white has uh, the bishop pair which is extremely strong in this position uh, especially the bishop on b2 and if you imagine uh, the bishop from e2 coming to c4 and staring at the king then those bishops compared to the knights are much much superior and white has a better pawn structure, he has, one could say, a safer king, and also a better minor piece, because this bishop isn't really doing that much. After castles, Karpov tries knight to e5, uh, we have queen to e3, uh, centralizing the queen, attacking the, the b6 pawn, bishop to e6, h3, b5, and now uh, rook a to c1. And in this position... White's, uh, White's advantage deteriorated a bit, and uh, positionally speaking, Black, Black is uh, out of trouble for now, because he managed to develop his pieces normally, White could, could have played more aggressively. However, White still has a lot of attacking prospects, and the main problem in, in Black's position, even though theory got it there, is this rook stuck, stuck on, on d5, and this rook doesn't really have that many squares to go to for now. It can't really be attacked because if, let's say, bishop to f3, then just knight takes f3. And there is no comfortable way of rounding up the rook. But that could soon change. And after uh, bishop to d7 now, uh, by Karpov, rook f to e1, developing his last piece, and now all the pieces are perfect, and there is nothing else uh, Eugenio Tore could do to improve and to develop. Now Kramnik makes, uh, I'm sorry, Karpov makes the, the losing move in the, sp the position. And even though visually the move is almost logical and it almost makes sense sense it makes the position just just busted for black he plays rook to c8 and this move makes some sense he has to try and challenge the c file uh, the c file at least even though it can't uh, he can't take over the c file but this move has several several pro problems connected to it the first one is that uh, okay uh, the knight on f6 is defended by the queen so if the queen moves then bishop takes knight would double uh, black spawns that's the first problem the second problem is that the rook on d5 is loose so if the knight on e5 is to move the knight which is defending uh, f, uh, f3 and d3 then bishop to d3 becomes possible all, all of a sudden and after bishop to f3 where does the rook go uh, c5 is taken um, d5 would have been attacked e5 is taken because of the bishop on, on b2, uh, f5 is taken by the knight, attacked by the knight, g5 is controlled by the queen, and the knight controls h5 as well. So will the bishop from f3. So the rook is lost, and that's the second issue with this position. The, the knight, which after it's taken, will uh, ruin black's uh, kingside pawn structure and king safety, and the rook which is about to fall, or the exchange which is about to fall, if the knight fr moves from e5. And Eugenio Torre manages to exploit both of these things with a series of highly precise moves which convert uh, this position pretty easily into just a winning, easily winning endgame or, or end of the middle game. First he plays rook to c8 and after the queen moves, 
Now, of course, the queen is no longer protecting f6. But as an intermezzo move to disturb the, the e5 knight from defending f3 and to remove it from blockading the f6 knight, first he plays f4, chasing the knight away, and after knight to g6, now bishop takes f6, doubling white's pawns, and bishop to f3, and the rook is now just lost. And this position actually came from here after rook f to e1. Uh, if from a completely normal position, almost equal, with white having a slight edge, nothing too major, after rook to c8 is just busted. Because now after g takes f6, bishop to f3, uh, black, okay, so he still has that extra pawn, but he has two sets of double pawns. He's about to lose the exchange and his king's safety is uh, compromised and he's just lost. So now queen to c4, uh, Karpov tries uh, to activate his, his queen at least and he has to defend the rook. And after bishop takes d5, queen takes d5. And by the way, after rook f to e1, um, instead of rook to c8, what Karpov should have played to remain equal was just bishop to c6, solidifying his position, uh, cutting out any infiltration squares from the from the white rook. And after, let's say, f4, trying to chase the knight away, knight to c4, and giving back the extra pawn, which, which he won, and just bishop takes, b takes, rook takes, and this position is completely equal. Perhaps white is, even, uh, white is even a bit worse here, because he pushed his f4 pawn a bit uh, too fast, and this diagonal is weak in particular. So yeah, this would have been a, an equal continuation for Karpov. But now after g takes f6, uh, bishop to f3, queen, uh, queen to c4, bishop takes, queen takes, he really doesn't have anything in the position. These pawns are terrible and they are easily attacked and they will definitely drop very soon. The e file is weak. Uh, this knight is just stuck in the defense of the king and any f5 will just dislodge it immediately. So the position is strategically and positionally lost. Materially it's equal, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, knight to e4 now by Eugenio Torre attacking f6 and threatening, of course, uh, to fork the king and queen. King to g7 defending. Now, uh, yeah, and now another amazing move by Eugenio Torre. There were simple and less, fle less flashy ways to finish uh, this position and to finish off Anatoly Karpov, but Eugenio Torre found the, the most beautiful way to, to finish the game. He played knight takes f6, and this move, okay, it sacrifices a piece for, for a pawn, but he was uh, the exchange up. Anyway, so. After this, black just has to take, otherwise he will lose the bishop or the queen. So king takes, and the point is that he is now able to play queen to c3 check, and this uh, uh, disables the king from retreating back for, uh, to g7. And now the king only has one square, really, or two squares, uh, and it goes, uh, it doesn't move anywhere. Uh, he plays knight to e5, offering uh, the piece back, which actually had to be taken, because if the king if the king uh, moves somewhere, if the king moves to, let's say, uh, I don't know, king to f5, then g4 check, king takes f4, and now queen to e3 is checkmate. So the king can't really go anywhere. And after king to c3, after queen to c3 check, so the only uh, square is cut off, and he has to play knight to e5, f takes e5 check, d takes e5, Rook to f1 check, king to e6, queen to c2, and you can see the position now is just, okay, white is one pawn down, he has uh, he has the exchange, but the main point is king safety and black's king is just running away uh, through the whole board and it, there's no way he could survive for long. e4, queen to c3, f5, queen to g7, inf infiltrating the position, attacking h7, queen to d2, Queen takes h7, and now Karpov tries getting a few checks in, queen to e3, king h2, queen to g5, there are no more checks, h4 chasing the queen away, the queen goes to g4, queen h6 check, king to e5, and now queen to g5, Eugenio Torre offers a queen trade, which Anatoly Karpov accepts, because it's better to lose than to be checkmated, it's better to lose and uh, in an endgame than to be checkmated, so queen takes g5, h takes g5, e3, g6, king to f6, king to g3, bishop to e6, king to f4, and okay, now there is no way for, for the e-pawn to, to remain safe. Black is going to inevitably lose the e-pawn. 
and this is just over e2 rook e1 bishop to c4 defending for the moment but after g7 king takes g7 karpov actually resigned after his own move and of course uh, eugenio torre is simply going to pick up uh, pick up the f5 pawn and there's nothing black can do to survive and the best move would probably be b6 or something like that or or king somewhere king to king to f7 and this move is just going up the board there is no way to stop it so i would say this is uh, probably the uh, the the game uh, the the highest quality game eugenio torre ever played and i think he didn't ma make a single mistake or even a single inaccuracy there were some positions in which he could have played a better move but the difference would be 0.2 or 0.05 or something like that so he played a game at almost engine strength and first of all he played 15 moves of uh, mainline theory at the time and mainline theory, theory still in the variation and after that he just played like a computer and he he defeated anatoly karpov i would say at the peak of his power because in, in the mid 80s uh, Karpov was actually stronger than, than he was when he became world champion and Kasparov did win uh, the title in 84 but it's it's just because Kasparov was stronger than Karpov it doesn't mean that Karpov wasn't stronger than 10 years prior to that so definitely a great achievement defeating Karpov at the peak of his strength unfortunately he did finish in the 14th last place uh, at the tournament but it was still a great showing and as I said before uh, Karpov won the tournament uh, Seiravan was in 7th uh, place, I think uh, uh, Lev Pologaevsky was 3rd, Jan Timan was 4th, uh, Tony Miles was somewhere, was somewhere in the middle of the scoreboard, so definitely a great tournament and a very strong tournament with 14 of the best Grandmasters. Okay everybody, thanks very much for watching this game from the Master Series and stay tuned for more games from the geniuses of the 20th century. Thanks, bye, cheers!